Hello and a warm welcome. I'm Armin Trost, professor at the Furtwangen University in Germany. And this is my series on human resources strategies, a real master course for advanced HR students, professionals and executives. This series is available on YouTube and on all podcatchers like iTunes or Spotify. All slides that support this series are available on my website. For more information, please read the description to this YouTube or podcast. I'd also like to refer to my book, Human Resources Strategies, available at most online bookstores. So, again, thanks for listening. Have fun and gain valuable insights into the fascinating world of HR strategies. So welcome back. This time we're going to talk about pay for performance. And this is a very, very, very fascinating topic. I must say, psychological wise, business wise, completely underestimated and pretty much misunderstood, I would say. So I would like to clarify some things in this episode. I would like to start with a little story. Yeah. And I would like to refer to a great book written by Mark Twain in the late um, 19th century. And it's The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. And in this book, there was a signature episode, really. It was the episode where Tom Sawyer did something bad <laughs> in the eyes of his Aunt Polly. And Aunt Polly, she thought she better punish Tom Sawyer. And she told Tom Sawyer, Tom, now, tomorrow, you will whitewash the fence of the house, a long fence. So Tom Sawyer had to do it. So he starts painting the fence and then a friend passed by. And I put it really short here now. A friend passed by and said, oh, poor Tom, you have to whitewash the fence, you poor guy. And Tom Sawyer, as smart as he was, responded and said, hey, this is not work. Look, this is fun. What a pleasure, you know. That's the coolest thing I've ever done. And my Aunt Polly, she was really careful about asking me. I mean, she could have asked anybody. No, no, she wanted to do me that thing because, you know, it's, it's a fence. It's, it's visible here. That's a very precious work. It's a, it's a privilege to do that. And his friend got curious. Say, hmm, can I do this also? Do you, will, will you let me whitewash this fence a little bit? And Tom Sawyer responded, no, 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 I only can do this. And Polly asked me to do this, you know. And then his friend got, friend got a little bit uh, more pushy and he said, okay, I, I give you my shirt, I give you my apple. And now at the end, Tom Sawyer took his knife or something like this, something precious, and let his friend whitewash the fence. Then other friends came by. And they also wanted to whitewash the fence. So the entire day, Tom Sawyer just sat there watching his friend, doing his work for him, and he earned money by letting them doing that. Isn't that cool? That's a cool story. And, you know, in this book um, from Mark Twain, Mark Twain reflected a little bit on his own episode he just wrote. And he said, and I quote from the book, work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do. Play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And um, he continues and said, I mean, the best thing you could do with very boring work is just frame, frame the work as an activity, something that is really special. Right? Only one in a thousand, maybe even two thousand boys can do this. Yeah. So th that was the quote, Tom. Th that was the sentence Tom said to his friend. That's something very, very special. You know, that, that's, that's a cool story. And, um, you know, this is not based on empirical evidence, but based on your empathy, you can feel that there is something 
true in that story and this truth in that story uh, can be translated in a in a hypothesis that says reward turns an activity into work in the eyes of the ones being rewarded yeah that's that's the idea here and that goes pretty much along with a lot of empirical evidences that we actually have so and, and there are various ways if if you if you for instance if you ask kids, uh, if you show kids something like kefir, which is a, a Turkish drink, and we assume that the kids has, have never drank that before, when you tell them, hey, just drink it, that's condition A. Condition B would be, drink it, you're going to love it. That's condition B. Condition C would be, drink it, and you get a ticket for cinema. And after a while, you ask the kids, do you like kefir? Those who just drank it, they liked it. But those who got a ticket for doing it, they did not like it. Why is that? I mean, you don't like something because you got a reward for doing it. Huh? Isn't that isn't that paradox? But that's the case. I mean, people think when you reward me for something, hmm, that must be work, right? Also, I mean, the the, the last thing that you can do to a kid, yeah. If you if you if you do something bad to 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 uh, Patrick, right? You tell the other kids, hey, if you're gonna play with Patrick, you all get an ice cream. That will look Patrick bad <laughs> because the children will think, oh, what's wrong with Patrick? We need to be rewarded for playing with him. Eh? So, reward turns something into work. It's something that you and that's the assumption here. Something that you don't want to do voluntarily okay that's psychologically speaking uh, some something that you have to keep in mind so here here is here is another idea another hypothesis saying rewards may affect behavior yes it does of course with with reward also with punishment you can affect behavior and our parents know this if you want to if you want your kids that they show a certain behavior, just threat them with punishment. If you don't do this, you will see I will punish you, like Aunt Polly did. Of course, you can change behavior. But there is one thing that you cannot change with, with, uh, with punishment. You cannot change the competence. And more importantly, you cannot change the attitude. So punishment and rewards very often also in business might be the easy way. As a manager, you just want to see that the people show behavior, maybe even, even even without believing in the behavior as such, you just offer them rewards or you just threaten them with punishment. And then you will receive the behavior, of course, but you will never assume that they like it, they that they believe it. Yeah, On the long run, it could be that we know that behavior can change attitude and sometimes force helps uh, on that way. But but on the short run, money can change behavior, but maybe not, maybe, maybe not the attitude. So here is another thing. And, and that to me is one of the most fundamental ideas around pay for performance. And I would like to show it with, uh, with two cases, um, which, uh, which I, I, I took from a, from a, a from a real cool book uh, um, published by by Pfeffer and Sutton, uh, the name of the book is Hard Facts, uh, Dangerous Half Truth, and Total Nonsense. It's an HR book, yeah, and it's about evidence. It's about empirical evidence in HR. And in this book, they refer to uh, two cases which are really cool. One case goes like this. It was Safe Light. Safe Light, it's a car windshield repair service. And in earlier days in uh, at Safe Light, the people received a fixed hourly wages. So they were they were paid for being there for the time spending at the company. Uh, and then they changed it into a piece rate system, meaning that employees got paid based on how many windshields they install. So for every windshield they install, they get money. It's a piece rate system. That's that's pure pay for performance. And the effects were incredible. 44% increase in productivity. And that was really a long-term effect. It, it, even, it even increased over time. So also 
the productivity of the newly hired employee were higher because, I mean, when you offer something like this, a piece rate system, you in particular attract those people who believe they can perform. We name that self-efficacy in psychology. So it's very attractive for high-performing people having a piece rate system. Um, the average wage only went up by 7%, but as I said, productivity went up by 44%. So that was an, a, a really successful story with SafeLight. So the CEO who decided this made a right decision saying, we're going to pay for performance and that paid off. Okay, so that's one proof, at least on one case, that pay for performance can really boost productivity to an incredible extent. So here's the other case. It's the city of Albuquerque. So when you think of Albuquerque, of course, we always think of Breaking Bad. <laughs> okay, at least that applies to me. Uh, it's about city cleaning. And also uh, in earlier days, uh, people were paced, uh, paid uh, uh, on, a, on a fixed way. So uh, fixed working hours and wages, that was the model before. And then it was changed. Um, in a way that uh, people, the garbage men, well, mainly men, yeah, the garbage men, they were allowed to leave earlier when they finished. So the idea was you have to be fast in cleaning the city. You have to be fast. So when you start in the morning, better be fast and do not work until the evening. So that was the incentive saying, hey, if you work fast, you can go home earlier. And that's a type of of pay for performance. I mean, it's not that the people receive more by 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 working fast. It's that they earn more 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 spare time, more leisure time, and the leisure time in that case more or less is the incentive. So that was a complete disaster. Uh, increase in illegal truck overload. Uh, no surprise, <laughs> of course. More traffic accidents, okay, no surprise. If the people drive faster, the probability is high that they, uh, they run into accidents. Less service quality, no surprise. And also, that's interesting, less time spent on work, which is not related to regular job. I mean, in earlier days, they also spent time in repairing trucks, helping each other, and so on, and that all disappeared. So the people only focused on being fast, going home early. So in that case, it was a complete disaster. Well, complete disaster. So how could that be? At Safe Light, pay for, for, pay for performance was a total success, while with the city of Albuquerque in the city cleaning, it was a complete disaster. So these two cases, they prove at least one thing, that pay for performance not always is a good idea. And maybe some of you know this this TED talk, uh, this very very uh, probably one of the uh, most often viewed TED talks uh, from uh, Dan Pink. Uh, the title of this uh, presentation is "The Puzzle of Motivation." I really like this talk, even at in my eyes that goes too short, uh, not in terms of time, but in in time in terms of 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 the of the practical conclusion. But that's the same thing uh, with the candle problem. Maybe you, uh, watch it, watch it. It's really worth watching it. So, and here's the here is the idea here. Here's the consequence. We learned that pay for performance increases productivity in cases of boring, standardized, measurable, and non-creative tasks, installing windshields, right? Um, so. Here we have to refer to one particular factor about the context. Uh, remember the context, episode 6 and episode 7? And this is in particular about task certainty. And, you know, there are tasks where the certainty of outcome is absolutely high. Yeah? Repetitive tasks, repetitive tasks, standardized tasks installing windshields, and the certainty of process is also high. You absolutely know how to do it, and you do it the same way every time, and you do it very often. The scope of the task is small. Doing the same thing over and over and over again, just do it. You don't have to think. Just do it. Yeah. In those cases, contingent pay, pay for performance, really 
increases performance. Really. Uh, and if you, the other thing that you can do is think about the story of, 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 of Mark Twain, Tom Sawyer, right? Just highlight the purpose of work, telling the people you do something really incredible. That's, that's what you do in those cases, right? But there is the other idea. There is the opposite idea. And let me add one thing here. Um, uh, when, you, when you also read books, uh, a, maybe a classic from uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, uh, Winslow Taylor uh, the classic about scientific uh, management, uh, was really a classic in management literature, maybe one of m one of the classic in management literature. Uh, he 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 Taylor he he defined Taylorism, and there are cool stories about compensation. and And, and there's one story in the book. Um, I hope I can remember it well. I just paraphrase it, where uh, a manager talked to a worker and asked the worker, "Hey, worker, are you a good worker?" And the worker responded, "said I don't know." What is a good worker? He said, a good worker is somebody who can carry this amount of stones from this place to another place. So, are you a good worker? Mm, I don't know. Okay, I pay you, and he, he mentioned a specific high amount of money. He said, you get, let's say, $20 for doing this in an hour when you do that. So, are you a good worker? And then the worker said, yes, then I'm a good worker. I'm a good worker. If I get this money for doing this, I will do it. Then I'm a good worker. This is exactly this idea. The people don't have to think in those cases. The outcome is clear and the process is clear. Really. If you tell somebody, hey, just, just collect apples from the trees. And for every ton of apple that you collect, you get amount of money. That's going to motivate. No doubt about it. But here's the opposite thing. In case of creative tasks, extrinsic rewards lead to a lower performance. Avoidance of risk. They take the easy way in too much focus. So, here comes a term. Here comes the term extrinsic reward. What is an extrinsic reward? An extrinsic reward is a reward that makes, makes people, drives people do something, perform something, just because of the reward, right? It could be a reward, an incentive, could also be punishment. And it's not that the people would voluntarily do that. They just do it in order to receive the reward. That makes a reward extrinsic. And if you do that with creative tasks, complex problem solving, yeah, you you reduce, you definitely kill motivation. You kill motivation. You should really avoid variable pay in, in those cases. If you really in your company, if you have jobs where complex problem solving is key, let's say in R&D, for instance, research and development, make sure, really make sure that you pay the people a good amount of base pay. Base pay but not variable pay. These people must be intrinsically motivated. With complex problem solving, the people need to explore. They should not go the easy way. They have to use their prefrontal cortex, which is full of effort. And they only will do it if they not necessarily love it, but if they at least like it. Yeah? Otherwise, they will not be good in doing it. Okay? So, pay a decent amount of base pay in order to get the right people on board. I mentioned that in the last episode. Base pay is about acquisition, getting the right people on board. But then stop talking about money. Get money out of people's mind. That's what you do with complex, creative tasks. Now, let me add some ideas around this extrinsic, intrinsic motivation thing. Here is a classic experiment. It's a, an experiment that you have to know, really. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's again a classic. It was done by, by Leper, Green and Nisbet in, uh, in, in the early 1970s. 
And I know already the title of this uh, classic article is, is thrilling. Yeah? Uh, it says, Undermining Children's Intrinsic Interest with Extrinsic Reward. I mean, when they talk about intrinsic interest, they mean intrinsic motivation. Uh, in other words, how can you kill intrinsic motivation with extrinsic reward? And the experiment goes like this. So there were children asked to draw pictures, right? Imagine this. Uh, three times ten children all in a separate room. And in every room there was a different condition, okay? So in one condition the children were promised a good player award. So the message was, hey children, draw a picture, right? And when you draw a picture, in the end, you get an award. Oh, how cool is that? In the other condition, uh, the children were told nothing. Just draw pictures if you like. Yeah, so they draw pictures. And then they got an unexpected good player award. In the end, just as a surprise. <laughs> hey, you draw so nice pictures. So look, here is an award. How nice is that? And in the third condition, the children did not receive any award. Never. Okay? So, that was the first phase of the experiment. And then a few weeks later, the same children got together in the same rooms and they had the chance to voluntarily draw pictures now. So on the tables, there were, there were pieces of paper and pen. And you know what children naturally do when they, when they are faced with paper and pen. They draw pictures, uh, at least most of them. And now in this condition, no group got any award. Nothing. Nothing. And now the question was, how much time do the children spend voluntarily on drawing pictures? What was the mean percentage? Huh? So, here are the results. In the condition where they earlier got a good player award, the children spent 8.59% of their time voluntarily drawing pictures. 8.59%. Now let's compare this to the other two conditions. In the unexpected good player award condition, it was nearly 17%, nearly double. And in the no award condition, it was 18%. So, I mean, you can imagine what happened. You see, when children get no award and they have never received an award before, they spend... 18% of their time drawing pictures voluntarily. But if there was one time earlier where they received an award for doing it, the willingness to voluntarily draw a picture drops to 9%. It nearly halves. It, it halves, actually. It halves. So 50% of the motivation was killed by giving an award voluntarily one time. And that effect was not so strong. And that's relevant. We're going to talk about this in a minute when the Good Player Award was just unexpected. Okay. Also, the quality of the pictures dropped significantly. So when children don't receive an award for drawing picture, but they expected one earlier, the quality was rather poor. And when they never received an award, you know, just voluntarily draw a picture, the quality is okay. I mean, that was measured uh, by, by having a, a, sh a, jury, uh, a jury, and uh, they have judged the, evaluated the quality of the pictures. And in the expected good player award condition where the children had a reward in the first condition, the quality was 2.2. Roughly. And in the no award condition, it was three on a scale from one very poor to five very good. Oh, that's, that's really significant. So with awards, you not only kill motivation, you not only kill performance when it comes to creative tasks, but also you kill the quality of work. And let me summarize this with one hypothesis here. 
we really can say that extrinsic motivators kill intrinsic motivation easily, easily. If you start giving a award for something, you have to continue doing it. And if you stop then, after a while, motivation get killed because you transferred intrinsic motivation into extrinsic motivation. And when you take away the extrinsic motivator, motivation will collapse. And, and really, that's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, such a robust finding, really. I mean, let me add one idea here about this dynamic of extrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Uh, you, you all know Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, you know, uh, contributing to Wikipedia is voluntary. All people who have ever contributed to Wikipedia never earned any money for this. But you also have to see that it's just a very small proportion of Wikipedia users who contribute. It's maybe one or two out of hundred, right? One of two out of hundred really actively contribute to Wikipedia, writing articles, improving articles or something like this. So there was a debate at Wikipedia thinking about whether or not Wikipedia should, could, should offer a kind of incentive, a small incentive maybe. And now here's the idea saying, okay, the people are intrinsically motivated, right? There is already a high level of intrinsic motivation. The people have joy in doing it. The work is the reward. And that's the definition of intrinsic motivation. The work is the reward, right? So they assume, okay, there is already a high level of intrinsic motivation. And if we now add a little bit extrinsic motivation to it, then we have even more motivation that's the idea maybe so saying intrinsic motivation plus extrinsic motivation ends up with sums up to a higher level of total motivation and that is wrong it's wrong so maybe here is uh, a simple picture and it, it's so crucial i sorry for sticking to this topic for a while but it, it fascinates me <laughs> you feel it yeah uh, Wine. You yeah, know, wine Wine is good. Uh, I don't drink wine. I don't drink al alcohol at all. But wine, I know, is good. From my earlier days, I learned wine is good. Right? Wine is good. Especially when you have a very uh, expensive, good wine. A good wine is a good wine. Okay. Water is also good, right? Water is good. Yeah, water is also good. Love water. Water is cool. I mean, water. <laughs> it's a... You couldn't live without water. Water is good, especially in a hot summer and you're thirsty. Water is good. Well, water is not as good as wine, right? So now you could say, okay, I have wine. And wine, in this case, is the intrinsic motivation. It's very precious. Intrinsic motivation is good. Extrinsic motivation always leads to higher performance than extrinsic motivation. That's something you need to know. So we have wine, the intrinsic motivation. And then I say, okay, let me put some water extrinsic motivation into the wine then i not only have wine i have wine plus water and that makes the wine even better the drink the result no it does not the water the extrinsic motivation makes the intrinsic motivation the wine worse so whenever you start to extrinsically motivate people you might kill the intrinsic motivation okay that's very important and there is another thing that we can learn from the from the uh, from this experiment from uh, leper green and nisbet with a children drawing picture you can reward good performance you can do this and good managers do this and it's a matter of appreciation it's a matter of valuing good work. Also, customers reward people. Custom and, and now here's the thing. If you do this, really, if you do this, you better do it in an unexpected way. <laughs> so it should come as a surprise. Yeah? Rewards only motivate when they come unexpectedly. The motivation does not last long and you should not do it too often. But sometimes, sometimes telling people, 
Hey, John. Here is it again. <laughs> John, thank you so much for your outstanding performance in the last weekend. I mean, that saved our life. Look, here are $200 or euro. Take your wife and go for lunch. You really deserved it. Okay. Handshake. Clap on the shoulder. John, good to have you here. Yeah, yeah That feels good. Sometimes that's a good way to go. But that must come unexpectedly. That turns into a completely different story when you say, John, hey, when you do this over the weekend, if you're going to save our life, you're going to receive $200. You feel it already. You feel it already. Then it becomes an extrinsic motivator and no more a matter of appreciation. So better be careful here. So let me sum up some thoughts around pay for performance because that's a, something that is so heavily discussed in many organizations. And here are some, some conclusions, some practical conclusions. You can use something like pay for performance when there are some circumstances. What are these circumstances? One circumstance, as you already have learned, is the task to be rewarded has clear outcomes and clear procedures to get there. A high task certainty. Okay? That must be the case. And there is no need for creativity, complex problem solving or any kind of exploration. When it comes to creative tasks, when it comes to complex problems, don't do it. Don't do it. Okay? Uh, it must be clear what the performance is and the performance uh, must be measurable. So think of the case of safe light. It was really clear. Okay, you have installed the windshield. Okay, we can measure it. The same is with sales, by the way. You really can measure the outcome. Uh, that is a prerequisite to, 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 to have something like pay for performance. And sometimes you might say, well, extrinsic motivation is absolutely enough to do the task well. I mean, think about the Taylor case I just shared with you. You want this worker to carry 20 tons from A to B? You pay the money? Okay, fine. It does not matter whether the worker does it in an intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated way. It does not matter. Just, just let him do it. Yeah, extrinsic motivation is enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's okay. Do it. You get the money. That's the deal. Full stop. Yeah. Um, and as you already learned, pay for performance is only appropriate when you can assume that people are not fully motivated. If the people are already fully motivated, then pay for, for, pay for performance will not do any difference. If they already give their best, uh, you can pay whatever you want, can, the motivation will, the, the performance will not increase. Right? So, uh, that, that, that's one thing and, and, and really I mean that goes along with that idea that with pay for performance you might be able you might be able to increase motivation if the people are not motivated enough but there's one thing that you can never increase with pay for, 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 pay for performance and that is the capability the competence yeah? so you must assume that the individual's which are to be rewarded, are capable enough to do the task. Yeah. So that's another point. And of course, when you pay for performance, let's say on an individual basis, you really have to make sure that the performance is determined only by factors that lie within the employee. Yeah. It's only the employee can affect uh, the performance and not the system. So that's another point that refers to the context. If you have divided labor, right? Divided labor. We were talking about this when we were talking about the context. If you have divided labor, everybody is doing his or her own thing. It's, so then it's okay. You can do something like this. If really the employee, him or herself, can affect his or her performance by him or herself, then it's okay. But if it's the entire team, you should not. You definitely should not reward individual performance that might kill teamwork so you see there are a couple of things that need to be considered and you know 
what really what really uh what really is puzzling me or sometimes frustrating me is that very often we see pay remuneration compensation as something that is a matter of finance or legal no it's not it's also of course it's also um but and, and very often it's the cfo who thinks about compensation systems <laughs> yeah <laughs> most cfo are not educated enough to understand the social and psychological dynamics behind what they do and and that's a mistake that's a mistake you have to look at pay for performance remuneration in total is something that really affects the behavior of people and it's complex it's complex but luckily we already know a lot about this one i mean that's one of the fields in industrial and organizational psychology where we already have uh, a rich base of of evidences and sources and studies but it's really it drives me crazy sometimes why all these sources why all these insights are ignored so much so i hope with this episode i could contribute a little bit and i could bring in some clarity uh let me mention one thing here at the end um there is one book that i can really recommend here it's a book written by alfie kuhn alfie kuhn uh he's a publisher an author brilliant author uh he wrote a book uh punished by rewards um that's a that's a great book i uh, really can read it's the best book in my eyes regarding this topic okay also you can read my book <laughs> of course i have summarized most things there human resources strategy is the name of the book uh, oh you already know it probably you already have it you should have it you should have it uh, okay so thanks for listening and see you next time <laughs>